Hello, and welcome back to California Geology. I am Dr. Robert Lopez. Today I want to show you some photos of evaporite minerals, in particularly the Death Valley region, and then I want to talk about the, the biochemical rocks. So here on the PowerPoint uh, is the Death Valley Playa. Remember, it's a dry lake bed. And when the water evaporates, what we find is that the, the, dis the dissolved ions in solution be come together in, in ionic bonds and make salts. And there's a variety of salts, but one of the more abundant ones is uh, halite, which is rock salt. And here you can see uh, some of the halite in the Death Valley Playa. Uh, it's more like eight years ago, I took some students out to Death Valley, and here they're actually tasting the halite. They, would have been better off tasting it in a, in a less silty area. But nonetheless, they're tasting this, the halite. And if we look closely, here I'm pointing out the cubic of, uh, structure of halite, right? There, remember, halite makes these nice cubes here, and this is on the Death Valley Playa making that cubic uh, halite. We actually walked out to the middle of the playa, and it, basically this is all you see. This is about late April uh, of about 2000, 2006. Here. So chemical limestones... Uh, well, they involve the precipitation of calcium and carbonate from water. And examples of chemical limestone include travertine, uh, the famous Tufa Towers over at Mo Mona Lake and at Cyril's Lake in, in uh, the Mojave Desert, and then cave stone, which is also found in caves. Remember, limestone can be generally defined as a rock composed of the mineral calcite. So recall that calcite will effervesce in, um, in hydrochloric acid, and so limestone uh, also effervesces. We'll do some testing of that in a little bit. Um, so let's go over here and look at some of these chemical limestones first. So here in the PowerPoint, we see Mercer Caverns here over near Angel's Camp, and Mercer Caverns has many of these cave stones. Either they're called stalactites because they're hanging from the ceiling, or stalagmites uh, grow from the floor up toward the surface. But there's flow stone, which is like a cave stone here. That would be a flow stone, cave stone. Um, travertine, I don't have any travertine, but that would form at um, hot springs. And then um, in this next picture here is a picture I took of Mono Lake, looking back toward the Sierra Nevada here. And Mono Lake has tufa towers. And tufa, uh, don't confuse it with tuff. Tufa is a sedimentary rock. Uh, composed of calcium carbonate. What happens is the, the Sierra snowmelt um, produces spring waters that percolate really under the lake, and when they encounter the briny, very salty waters of Mona Lake, uh, the calcium and the carbonate from these br uh, from these spring waters make the the tufa tower. Uh, so that, those are examples of some chemical limestones. So now I want to look at the the biochemical uh, sedimentary rocks. And we'll find that there's going to be basically two groups of these. Uh, they're going to be uh, organisms that makes, make glass or silica shells. It's more like an opal or opaline shell. And then other organin, uh, organisms that make uh, a shell out of calcium carbonate. So there'll be siliceous deposits and calcareous deposits. So let's look at our, at our chart here. So for the biochemical limestones, these are the hard body parts of organisms. They include shells of coral, crustaceans, mollusks, plankton. In fact, plankton is going to be the most important one. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I want to show you that many organisms do make their shells out of calcium carbonate. And when the organism dies, they can leave uh, their shell behind, and that would become sediment. So here I have um, a, a little carapace of, um, of uh, um, spider crab. And then I have a test of a, of a, um, of a sea urchin here, or of a sand dollar. So the sand dollar, if I put a little bit of acid on it, it should fizz because it's composed of calcium carbonate. And you can see the, the reaction there, the bubbling. So that's telling us that uh, the sand dollar is making its test, its internal sh shell, out of calcium carbonate. And the same thing goes for our, our little spider crab here. And well, if we look carefully, we'll start seeing the effervescence. So these are organisms that are making their, their hard body parts out of calcium carbonates. This is the same for, for clams and snails, right? And coral as well. Now, let's look over here. Um, I have a, a note here. Uh, one of the questions I ask is, which limestone is more abundant, the chemical limestone 
or the biochemical limestone. And biochemical limestone is more abundant. It, it forms mostly in the ocean. And so the ocean is a, a large area of our planet, whereas these chemical limestones are more restricted to local areas, like hot springs or, or springs under Mono Lake, for example, or, or caves there. Now, let's look at some of these biochemical rocks here. And so there's going to be, like I said, there's two groups. There's a group that's going to secrete calcium carbonate. In other words, they're making, they're taking calcium and carbonate from seawater or from water and making their shells. Other organisms take silica out of water to make their shells. And so for the calcium carbonate, some of the macroscopic organisms, there's clams, snails, corals, crabs, lobsters, and basically two types of rocks will form. One that's going to be, um, in fact, this one here I always say is, is well cemented. So the well cemented rock is called a, um, a fossiliferous limestone or a calcarinite. Fossiliferous limestone or calcarinite. And in fact, I have one right here. This is um, from the, the Ordovician. There's some little sea stars you see in here. There's, uh, uh, here I see a brachiopod. Uh, some variety of little fossils in here. And remember, limestone uh, is composed here of the fossils, but also there's a, it's a carbonate cement. So if I put a little bit of acid on the cement there, you should see that um, that little fizz. So you can see the fizzing going on right here. So it's, re it's, it's composed of calcium carbonate as well. So this is an example of a fossiliferous limestone or a calcarinite. On the other hand, if, if the um, shells are kind of uh, uh, weakly cemented or porous, if there's pores in the rock and you still see fossils in there, we call that rock a coquina. And here I have a coquina composed of a variety of shells here. And you can see that there's holes in this rock or pore spaces. We'll zoom in a little bit so you can see the, the, the little fossils in there. And again, we try the, the, the acid test here and we'll see that, um, sure enough, this fizzes because it's composed of shells, broken shells, all plastered together, making this rock coquina. So two types of, of fossil limestones, one being the fossiliferous limestone, the calcarinite, and the second one, uh, the porous one, which is coquina. Now, um, in terms of, of uh, uh, silica secreting organisms, they're only going to be planktonic organisms. And so, and in terms of, you know, macroscopic for the calcium carbonate, they're also plankton. So let's look at plankton first. And plankton is really comes from the Greek word um, planet, which means wanderer. So remember the, the Greeks would look at the stars and stars were fixed, but planets moved around. So they wandered around in the skies. So we use the word plankton to describe a weak swimmer in the ocean, in the, in the marine environment. And so Greek for wanderer, weak swimmer, free floater. Um, usually they're small, although jellyfish are, can be considered plankton as well. Now, um, uh, you'll, you'll hear me use the word calcareous ooze and silicious ooze, which describes uh, uh, the dead body parts of, or of these plankton that sink to the sea floor. Literally, it's like a perpetual rain in the ocean, this material coming down and settling onto the sea floor. And so an ooze must have about 30% either... Uh, calcium carbonate secreting organisms or siliceous secreting or organisms um, sink into the seafloor. The rest of it might be some mud and some other materials, but um, uh, at least 30% to make the ooze here. Now, um, probably the best way to, to differentiate among the plankton is to separate them into, into two categories. Zooplankton, which are animals or animal-like plankton, so like the larvae stages of, of, um, of bigger animals, when they grow up, they'll eventually be strong enough to swim, and they'll leave the plankton world. Um, also, copepods and krill can, are examples of zooplankton. On the other hand, pho phytoplankton, well, these do uh, photosynthesis. So these are a variety of algae, right? And then here I have, we have some that make a calcium carbonate or calcareous ooze. So these eventually make limestone, whereas uh, a siliceous ooze or silica plus plus some amount of water, well, that, that makes opal or opaline quartz, and they will make a rock called chert or diatomite. So for the zooplankton, in fact, both, both foraminifera and radiolarians, they're, they're amoebas. They're a variety of amoeba. And these amoebas uh, uh, 
with with shells. They have a shell, and um, amoebas belong to um, the, the kingdom Protista, and they're really called protozoans. So they're not quite animals, but they're consumers. Uh, so these protozoans, these amoebas with shells, when the amoeba dies, it leaves a shell behind and leave either a calcareous ooze, foraminifera ooze is a word we can use, or a radiolarian ooze, which is silicious. Uh, on the other hand, for the phytoplankton, these coccolithophores, uh, they make their shells out of calcium carbonate, and they primarily make the rock called chalk. Uh, uh, whereas diatom will make a rock called diatomite here. Diatomite. One of the things about diatoms, they because they they're photosynthetic, they use um, uh, oil for flotation. For flotation, and so uh, that oil eventually um, uh, uh, that oil eventually will 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 form um, oil deposits, right? And in fact, diatoms are a big source of California's oil. So if we look down here and look at some of the rocks, chert, uh, siliceous radiolaria ooze, as I said earlier, diatomite composed of diatomaceous ooze, and the famous formation here in California is called the Monterey Formation. Uh, well exposed in Monterey, but you can find it from Point Reyes Peninsula all the way down to the Los Angeles Basin, and it is a source of California's oil here. Now, um, we'll say more about that when we start talking about the coast ranges, but let's look at some of these plankton on the PowerPoint here. Now, um, in this picture here, I have uh, mostly phytoplankton. I have the coccolithophore, which makes its, its little umbrella shells out of calcium carbonate. Here's a little coccolithophore that's landed on the seafloor and it's starting to break up, the very fine grain. And here is a diatom. So these diatoms make their, their glass houses or opaline houses here. If we look here, um, this, is, this is a picture actually taken from Santa Barbara, looking out toward uh, Santa Cruz Island out here. And the, the Santa Barbara Channel is, is, well, this is what you see. You see these oil rigs, and they're drilling into, uh, into the Monterey Formation, or at least into sediment, where the oil has migrated from that formation, has leaked into, into other rocks, into the oil shale rocks. And um, this Monterey Formation uh, does have a lot of these diatoms, and they're a source of oil. But the thing about the shale shale is, has a low permeability. In other words, it's well compacted. In fact, uh, shale is an example of a sedimentary rock that needs no cement to, to stick the grains together because they're so well compacted. All you need, all you need is barrel and compaction. So one of the problems is uh, there is a lot of oil um, under the Central Valley, under the Monterey Formation under the Central Valley, uh, down near Hollister, Piscina, south there in the Highway 25 corridor. And there is a proposal to go down there and put fracking fluids down there, which will force open these cracks, this, this well-cemented, low-permeable Monterey formation to allow some of that oil on. Yeah, um, foraminifera here. So for foraminifera, uh, remember these are amoebas that make a shell. And so uh, they have these sticky arms that's, that come out here, and they'll eat other plankton. Right? They'll eat other plankton. And it, it, when the when the foraminifera dies, it sinks to the seafloor and makes uh, a deposit of of foraminifera ooze, which eventually forms a rock called limestone. But he, these are all the little holes. In fact, foram is a word, a Greek word, which means bearer of windows. So lots of little windows here. And then in terms of the of the silicious ooze, here are some diatoms. Remember, they're making the the diatomite, whereas uh, um, the the radiolarians here, these are so again, these are amoebas, uh, but they make a shell out of glass. And so the radiolarian ooze will make a rock called uh, chert. And chert is, is exposed in the Marin Headlands just across the Golden Gate Bridge. It forms these bands of chert uh, right across uh, uh, the, the, the Golden Gate Bridge. And if you look carefully in a microscope, you'll find that they're full of these little radiolarians. And all these date back to the Jurassic period. Um, uh, so it gives us an idea of, how, of the age of this chert in, in um, the Monterey, uh, sorry, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Well, anyhow, let's stop here and then we'll continue with um, sediment maturity.